So, everybody, you're going to have to make me feel a little better about myself because I'm an associate director and I'm surrounded by all the other speakers who are CEOs next to their name. So I feel a little insecure, but that being said, I'm going to share a couple of strategies that really served us well uh, from a new hire sales training perspective at Bristol-Myers Squibb. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Bristol-Myers Squibb. Okay, great. Okay, terrific. So for those of you who don't know, Bristol-Myers Squibb discovers, develops, and delivers innovative medicines to help patients uh, not only transform their lives, but overcome serious diseases. We're considered the largest global biopharma oncology company, so we focus specifically on patients with cancer, but we also cover different disease states, including cardiovascular, hematology, and immunology, just to name a few. I've been with Bristol-Myers Squibb now since July 2020, Really grateful to be here. Um, but my story, and when I started my career, I graduated from St. Joseph's University in 2013 with a pharmaceutical and healthcare marketing degree. So I knew when I was 18 years old, hey, I want to be a professional drug dealer. And <laughs> the rest is history. So I've enjoyed a couple of unique experiences throughout my career. At Sanofi, I enjoyed um, sales, sales training, as well as consumer healthcare marketing. Uh, another show of hands. Does everybody know the brand Icy Hot? I see hot, right? Yeah, so we all rise from pain. Right You're using it right now? I could use it right now. Hold on one second. We've got a live audience testimony. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, so that wasn't the most glamorous job I had, but what was really cool about working on Icy Hot was I got to do Shaquille O'Neal's expense reports. So that was really lit. I loved it. Um, there's my point for the millennial word. Yeah, I'm trying to engage with the college students. Is it still I don't know. No. It could be. You know, the jury's out on it. But, um, but I digress. So I was at Sanofi for six and a half years. Um, as I was exiting, I ended up being airlifted to safety to Novartis, which is another leading pharmaceutical <laughs> company. And I was uh, doing uh, sales with them. So I was doing account management in Metro New York and Manhattan. Um, however, COVID brought things to a screeching halt. So I was no longer selling or going to meet some of my clinicians at Northwell. I was instead interacting with my teammates on Microsoft Teams like once weekly. So I got recruited uh, by my now leader, Pedro Rivera. He reached out to me on LinkedIn and he said, hey, I think you've got a background in training. Would you be interested in coming over to oncology? And I didn't think twice about it. Oncology is such a patient-focused business unit. You're literally helping people with cancer not only navigate their disease, but thrive. So it's incredibly important and inspiring work that I get to do each and every day. And my role, just to give you a little bit of context with the organization in which I reside, sales training interacts directly with our salespeople. So pharmaceutical reps, medical device reps, they educate clinicians, but also nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, um, and also bring awareness to the disease to the patients who are afflicted by it. I'm also an intermediary with our marketing and brand team. So those are folks who are responsible for profit and loss, brand strategy. So how can I take their brand strategy, make it distilled and easy to understand? That way a salesperson can communicate with confidence and execute flawlessly on every single call. That way it leads to disproportionate market share. So with that said, hopefully that brought you down memory lane and you got a good kick out of some of my little jokes. But um, let me share with you a little bit about my journey and what we're doing differently at Bristol Myers Squibb to empower an agile sales force with hybrid learning. So, uh, funny enough, we didn't coordinate our slides, but I think Friday the 13th is the theme of the day. So, um, what's really unique about this picture and what speaks to me is that, you know, Friday the 13th came around and we thought that it'd be like every other day. I was a little superstitious, but I didn't have my rabbit's foot with me. I didn't wear my pajamas inside out. I just thought it was a regular day. But for our commercial teams and our salespeople, it upended and changed the way they've done business. So they went from in-person interactions to overnight having to smile, dial, get on Teams, get on Zoom, meet the customers where they were, and really deliver impactfully. We, re we couldn't sleep on the business because patients are waiting. So how did we show up differently? I'm going to walk you through a couple of key things that the U.S. Oncology Training and Talent Development team did. It's a bit of an eye chart, so I'm not going to drain it. I really invite you to have a conversation with me today. But it was really in three key areas. So the first, if this points, which is awesome, demonstrate high emotional intelligence, so EQ, and competent communication in virtual customer calls. So what I mean by that is we had clinicians who were on the front lines. 
Raise your hand if you knew somebody who was on the front lines during COVID. I think we all knew somebody, right? So they were under pressure, overworked, underpaid, overwhelmed. And we really had to show up with high emotional intelligence. That way, not only were we connecting with them, but that our message was ultimately resonating. So we focused on emotional intelligence training and pull through with those activities first and foremost. We also know that with our sales team, their comfortability with technology really runs a continuum. We have folks who are really enjoying technology, who feel really proficient with it, and we have others not so much. So what we did was we invested in those early weeks of the pandemic in platform skills training. So essentially, how can you angle your camera correctly, that way you don't look like a hot mess with your customer, but most importantly, how can you communicate clearly and concisely, that way what you're saying resonates and encourages them to take action. So we were really intentional with that. Um, psychology of selling and value conversations, those are two of our proprietary uh, customer engagement models. So really unpacking um, and getting inside the customer's brain, so to speak, and move them from uh, basically giving us a smoke screen as to why they won't use our product to pulling the trigger and taking action for the patients who qualify. The second um, area that we really prioritized with intentionality was accelerating proficiency with systems and tools. So MS Teams, Zoom, Viva Engage, all these ways to really deliver our virtual brochures in a way that's gonna resonate with clinicians because we know, even from a retention or marketing perspective, that you can say something, the customer may remember, they may recall probably what, like one, 5% value, why with the why not, I'm looking at you, yeah, like 5%, right? But if you show something with a visual, you then accelerate that retention, you know, 10, tenfold, which is really incredible, so getting them comfortable with presenting, showing slides, different things like that, that was really paramount for us. And then lastly, streamlining and evolving your new hire training. That was something that I was really passionate about and an advocate for. I was joking with my colleague, Bernice, who's also here. She's one of our instructional designers on our worldwide training and talent development team. Prior to COVID, we would invite new hires from all over the world to come to our headquarters in Princeton Pike, and they would be in a classroom from eight to five. Not me, not now, not ever. Hybrid is the way forward. And I'm looking at my college student friends in the back. Can you imagine having to be engaged from eight to five all day in a classroom with no break? Hmm. They're blank staring at me. Yeah, that's how I feel. Say it louder for the people in the back. So what we did was we essentially broke up the day, streamlined it, provided micro learning moments, and in short, to Valerie's point earlier, that we were including them in our learning community and creating conversations that matter because once they were engaged and participating, then we knew that they were gonna go out there and crush it for the patients who needed it. Any questions so far? Any re reactions, reflections? Tracking with you? Yeah. Good question. And what's your name? Dan. Nice to meet you, Dan. Nice to meet you as well. What does productive tension mean under number one? What an oh. example of that? So, I think you're setting me up for my next slide. <laughs> Do you want my Venmo? <laughs> I got you, buddy. There we go. Okay, so productive tension. Great question, by the way, Dan. Thanks for asking. So this is really an opportunity just to provide a bit of context. So we don't work in a single product environment within medical sales. We have what's called a commodity marketplace. So our products would be easily substituted by the next guy or the next gal that comes into the doctor's office just based on their value proposition, how they're positioning, uh, their marketing message, and the spiel that they give to their customers. So in order to really accelerate customer adoption and ensure that they're buying what we're ultimately selling, we gotta turn up the temperature, and we gotta ask them directly, hey, why not? Why wouldn't you choose this product? What is holding you back? Where can I help clarify for you? And sometimes it's really more of a strategic play around how we ask questions to engage. I think when I joined the industry in 2013, it was still a show up and throw up type of mentality. Hey, we got this great data, show up, lay it all out there, it's a drop the mic moment. Now, you have to have a conversation. Who thought, right? You know, it's like online dating. Do you wanna go with somebody who's just gonna like talk your ear off? Probably not, you're gonna say check please, or let me excuse myself, go to the bathroom and never call you again. So, you have to make sure that you're having a conversation, and I think the questions and the strategies that you ask are really gonna help turn up the, the temperature slightly in a respectful manner, and also encourage the customer to take action. So, did that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. And I'll then invite you, so thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions so far? How are we doing? 
I, I love it. And I'm yeah. just curious, do, do you use this concept both ways? So do you also believe that a little um, productive tension on your salespeople gets them to take additional actions that they may that they might not like? Totally. You kind of use it both ways. Yeah, and I, I think too, so we do a fair amount of hand holding with our salespeople because they are our most expensive asset. They really are. So they're like our quarterbacks, right? We gotta make sure that they're treated well, everything like that. But in order to grow, you have to be pushed out of your comfort zone. So in the new hire environment, I'm all about, and I think Valerie alluded to this earlier, put them out front. Hey, I don't have to be the subject matter expert. You guys ultimately have to. So who has the answer to the question? You know, for example, Vanessa, do you have the answer? If Vanessa doesn't, hey, who wants to help Vanessa out? So we turn up the temperature in a way that encourages them to think on their toes, think strategically, but also be bold. And if they don't know, they don't know, and they'll figure it out. So I think that's one element of it. Another way that we also encourage productive tension is through our simulations. So we'll actually invite, instead of conducting role plays with their peer or their direct manager, we invite real life physicians to come in. And what, that's, what that does is it really replicates the environment they're going to model. So it gives them, in that learning environment, that safe environment, an opportunity to demonstrate some of these strategies and see if they land. Or what could they do differently? How could they fit it? Did that make sense? Yeah. Very much so. Okay. Cool. Thanks for the engagement so far. So Sue, I'll give you Venmo also. Yes. Yeah, sure. cool. yeah. Awesome. Down with coffee, free coffee. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So the red thread is really everything that connects us together, um, and at the center of everything is our learner, our participant, our salesperson. On the left, you'll notice that there are a couple of guiding principles that really inform our training footprint and our training strategy. The first is that we need to have strategic alignment and make sure that we're pulling through all of the strategic imperatives from our marketing and our brand team. So what I mean by that is, at the beginning of each year, we encourage our training managers to sit down with their marketers and, and also continue to maintain that partnership, of course, throughout the course of the year but really understand, hey, what's gonna be a driver of your business or what's gonna drain it? Meaning, what are some internal or external threats that are gonna impact your market share over the next year? How can you then develop what's called a strategic learning plan? So what does your tactical footprint look like, your training footprint look like? That's going to dovetail and ladder up to everything we need to achieve from a brand strategy perspective. The next thing, and I said this before, was really around encouraging customer conversations. No more showing up and throwing up. Have a conversation. Ask the question. I had a really cool manager when I was in the field not too long ago, and he said, Christian, you gotta peel back the layers of the onion. And it's so true, right? You gotta ask a question. Even asking why provokes thought. And another example that I'd like to share, just to answer and crystallize your question further, Sue, is we encourage our salespeople to not ask close-ended questions. Keep it open, because what that does is that really puts the onus on the customer then to come out of their shell, educate you a little bit more, and inform you around what they're thinking. And then lastly, our um, salespeople don't work um, alone. They actually work in teams. Our oncologists are um, very high priority customers. So they're possibly in surgery, they're seeing patients, they're delivering a lot of different information at a time. So for that reason, appointments are hard to come by for our salespeople, so they can't act alone. They have to go into each customer environment in a pod of two to three salespeople. So how do they transition? How do they develop that pre-qual plan that gets them set up for success and ultimately engage with impact when that customer is ready? So those are really our guiding principles. How do we operationalize it? We listen to our field. So I'm really proud of the work that we do that's learner developed. So for the people, by the people, for the learner, by the learner. Um, the first visual, and this is a bit of an eye chart, so forgive me, but um, this is our, uh, all, where all of our tactics are housed, and it's called the Oncology Learning Portal. We basically use a SharePoint site, and it's a step above our learning management system, so our LMS for short. And it just makes it that much more real-time ready to provide job aids, infographics, different visuals that are going to help accelerate learner retention and focus. Um, these right here, this visual, these are two infographics. So for the folks in the back of the room, an infographic is basically taking a very dense clinical study and putting it into a one-pager. Salespeople have the attention span of flies. And I know I'm on camera, but I'm not afraid to say it. Because I used to be, I used to be a salesperson too, so I totally get it. It's a requirement. 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you have to serve content that's like 30 seconds or less, bite-sized, micro-learning, and it just makes people engage with what you're giving them, that education, that much more. Another thing that I'm going to expand on, or another initiative, this was led by um, one of my senior leaders on my team. Her name is Jill Bird, and she had a clinical background as a clinical nurse. And she was thinking, hey, Christian, I've got an idea. And I'm like, OK, you know, tell me, what are you thinking? She's like, for new hires who are hired during COVID, they're not going to be able to go into an actual oncology clinic or see an infusion suite, because all of our drugs are delivered intravenously through an IV until we're out of this pandemic, which we don't know when that's going to happen. So she's like, I was thinking, maybe we can provide like a augmented reality, virtual reality type of simulation where they could get that almost hands-on clinic, but from the comfort of their home. And I was like, I love that. That's awesome. So let's run with it. So I gave her the money. She operationalized it. And we made magic happen, which was really cool. Because now our learners who may not have had oncology experience, may not have ever been in, a, in an infusion suite, they're now able to show up after training with renewed confidence, renewed swagger, and go in and feel like they're confident and confident to win for patients. So that was a really cool innovation. And then last but not least, who knows on the air with Ryan Seacrest? Yeah? OK, cool. So uh, being that I love all things pop culture, I was like, I'm going to be Ryan Seacrest at BMS. And we're going to call it on the air with GU. GU stands for <laughs> genitourinary cancer. So GU cancers, kidney, bladder, and prostate. So we do podcasts, which are really great. Our salespeople are sometimes driving in their car on the way to accounts. So they've got a lot of windshield time. So we serve up content no more than like seven minutes an episode, but it covers everything from clinical acumen, disease state, competitor knowledge, and it just gets their juices going and gets them swagged up before they have to go in front of a customer and really crush it. So really cool stuff. I'd love to hear, yeah, what's your name? My name's Pat. Awesome, hey Pat. Hey, quick question for you. Yeah. Um, regarding the tools, Mr. Miles Squid is a pretty big company. Mm -hmm. Do you have issues, whether it be with the sales team or beyond, with people know, knowing where to go to find them three months, four months, five months after they take the training? Are you smiling too? Yeah. <laughs> so this is something that we always, you know, we're faced with. We always confront this battle um, because, you know, somebody may come in new from a leadership perspective. Hey, let's get another platform going. Let's get Inkling. Let's get another, you know, Pulse. Let's do this. Virgin America. It's like, okay, it's an embarrassment of riches after a while. So to your point, Pat, I think what we've decided to do now is simplify and utilize the platforms that we have, but be more intentional about how we communicate where they're located. Sometimes we, and because our team is large, um, from a home office and a field perspective, we really put the onus on our field trainers, on our oncology district trainers, to pull through the accessibility of our resources. But if I was to make a guess or a prediction, I think we're going to start moving in the direction more of mobile-based apps and you know, vehicles and platforms that provide just-in-time content for the learner that needs it. So another thing that I'm going to discuss in just a moment is our remote learning gym. It's very similar to like a hit video that you would, or a hit class that you would sign up for at your gym, where you get that content at the time that you want it. So it's served to you in real time, instead of having to weed through a SharePoint or a learning management system. So short answer, yeah, we're still confronted with that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And what's your name? Uh, Kayla. Awesome. Hey, Kayla. Okay. So, with the tools developed by the learner, for the learner by the learner, do you have trouble with managing them, or do you have a process for reviewing them, making sure it's the content that you need? Like, how do you just manage those resources once they're compiled? Yeah. Should they stay current? Yeah, that's a great point. Great question, Kayla. So, our vetting process is extensive because we work in a heavily regulated industry. So we always get alerts, hey, your content is about to expire in 30 days, 60 days, whatever. That's like a very you know, passive way of informing us. But we also have subject matter experts employed who help us keep current. So for example, within kidney cancer, we just had a recent approval from a competitor, you know, a really stiff competitor that we have to meet head on. Um, so what we do in that case is we rely on our SMEs, our subject matter experts, to inform us. We make the changes, we run it and align it by some of our senior territory business managers or salespeople to make sure it's accurate and relevant from a content perspective, and then we deploy it. So yeah, we have to vet everything, and we also have to have tentacles, almost like an octopus, right? So be on the cutting edge, be informed always, and in always. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're also very regulated, that's why I was curious. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, with adult learning, it takes a village, right? So even if you're a one-man or a one-girl show, you can tap into your prized possession, which is normally your frontline people, your salespeople. Their intelligence, their intellectual property is like next to gold. So the closer that you are with them, they're going to filter in things like the competitive threat, the competitive intel that enables you to meet them where they are. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And you had a question? Yeah. What's your name? Diane. Oh, and you're our icy hot advocate, right? <laughs> Wearing it right now? Cool. Okay, good. Um, I have a question for you regarding the simulation. I'm yeah. curious, how is that developed by the work? Yeah, so we use um, basically focus groups. So each month we get together with our top performing reps. Uh, they're part of what's called a sales and brand um, sort of cohort. And we hop on a MS Teams or a conference call with them. And we say, hey, what are some ideas that you have? What are some ways that we can sort of spitball, brainstorm, and develop our best thinking? So it really came from not only my direct uh, uh, employee on my team, but also with her partnership in collating some of that feedback and those responses from that focus group. But the technology behind it yeah. is something. Well, we, have, we partner with like a, an agency called Red Nucleus. So they have the capability externally where they could almost retrofit it into our learning management system okay. and help us operationalize it. So they have a lot of the agencies that we partner with, Red Nucleus, Devlin Hare, Acteon Communications, for example. These are really well established in the learning and development field, and they're on the cutting edge. So they'll come to us with requests for proposal, RFPs for short, and we have an opportunity to discern, okay, what is the capability that we want to use to evolve our learning approach? Yeah. So they help us to that. Is that accurate, Bernice? That is, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Bernice is my fact checker. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts or reflections so far? How are we doing? How much do you love the um, podcast? Who does it? Do you do it? I do it. It's my it? voice. No. My intellectual property. <laughs> I'll let you know my fate if you're interested. Yeah. Well, I do it, but then we also have special guests. So I've always wanted to be a talk show host. I think it's the best thing. It's so cool. I get energized by the Today Show, and this is my version of it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, what's, what's your, your name? Oh, Alandi. Hey, how are oh, you, Alandi? I'm good. good. And my Starbucks art order is um, turn to black tea lemonade unsweetened. Okay, I got so you. So no yeah. necessary. Okay. Um, so with these, the content, um, how frequently are these rolled out, like your podcast, et cetera, to the staff? And um, do they always have to filter through all the trainings um, to decide which one they would use? Or Yeah, that's a great question. So. To make it simple, we've got a sales force of about 400 personnel, and they'll team up on a couple of different tumor indications. So for example, the tumors that I lead are kidney cancer, bladder cancer, and prostate. We also have lung cancer, we have melanoma, we also have um, gastroesophageal cancer. So depending on which sales sleeve they're in and which tumors they're promoting to their customers, they're gonna have the content curated for them, so they don't have to dig through it. It's really gonna be filtered by what they're actively promoting. Um, and then as far as like cadence, it really depends on what's on the radar for the field. So to make a long story short, when our field teams were going through COVID, they had the luxury of time. Appointments were hard to come by. Customers were somewhat receptive to virtual calls, some of them weren't. So they could really engage, our sales teams can engage in learning and in training more readily. Now, as more and more customers open up, more geographies open up, and we go into this peri-pandemic situation, they're encouraged to go out into the field and have face-to-face -face contact. So we have to be really vigilant to not over-index, but like, for example, a podcast may go out once monthly, the infographics and the job aids, those visuals, those get updated like once every four to six months just because of the speed of approvals within our environment. Um, and then anything that's really particularly new, like our um, oncology learning gym that I'm going to expand on in a moment, that's something that's served in the moment, leveraging existing resources. Answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. One thing that I'm really passionate about is recognition. I think learners need to feel validated always and in all ways. And I think for the academics in the room, if you're not calling out your students, you should really consider it because it's going to encourage them to be engaged, but also develop that connection with you and pay it forward. Um, an engaged student is one, in my opinion, that activates the learning for everybody else. We learn the most from those who are learning themselves, right? So the more that you can get those learners recognized and stimulated, 
the better your learning environment is going to be. And you're actually probably going to see retention go up, proficiency gains. It's really, really paramount. So we recognize our learners, and I was a huge advocate for this with rolling this out. We provide badges digitally and in our training app to our new hires as they come through new hire. In the past, we used to just provide an MVP award for that one student who would raise their hand a bunch of times. So it was almost like, okay, if you're if your participation award, but is there any meat on it? Is there any meat on the bone behind it? With this, we're not only able to democratize the learning, but also get other people to feel engaged based on the behavior that they exhibit. So if you're a team lead, you're getting a teamwork badge. If you're demonstrating inclusive behaviors, which is really huge, you're empowering other people to share their voice, speak their mind. We want to recognize you for that. Hey, you did an awesome, awesome role play. You were impactful. We're going to give you a badge for that. Inspiration, we sometimes do get um, cancer survivors and cancer thrivers, I like to say, who come through our learning environment. Any stories that we could share connect us to our deeper purpose. So we love to incentivize that as well. Just creates that stickiness with our learning that I think Valerie alluded to earlier. And then lastly, clinical acumen. So how confident and confident are you in your clinical backbone and your clinical knowledge where you can then demonstrate that and have cool clinical conversations with your customers? And then this is my final slide, but balance really does make us stronger. I think, you know, what's so cool is when I joined the industry in 2013, hybrid was sort of non-existent. I mean, I was a salesperson on my own. I was remote by design because of my customers. I was, you know, promoting vaccines and allergy medications, cardiovascular diabetes throughout Staten Island, Metro New York, New Jersey, and that was great. When I first got into the home office in 2017, it was like a culture shock. I was like, wow, how does everybody show up here five days a week? That's just madness. And now we're 50% of the time, and it's like a pure luxury. I think for the students in the back, I encourage you, prioritize work life, because you never, ever get it back. And if you have an opportunity to work hybrid, work remotely, travel, work from anywhere, you could get the work done and you could still have a great life, which is really what it's all about at the end of the day. So I think that this environment right now that we're in is so humane. <laughs> you said it was your last slide. So. <laughs> well, okay. Whatever, I don't need the slide. Don't take that person. It's okay. <laughs> Sure, I, I, I do think, and I, I have to be really cognizant of this, COVID was really awful for so many people. You know, we really have to acknowledge that. Yeah. There was a lot that was gained though. You know, being able to work remotely, being able to have time with your family, your kids, work out, have a balanced diet. Those are things that, you know, we really took for granted when we were commuting all over the place. Oh yeah, I know commute during COVID. I mean, that's freaking right. awesome. So I really encourage all of you, as you head into the job market, no matter what industry you matriculate into, prioritize your mental sanity, your physical well-being, and look for an area where you can make hybrid work for you. May I get that last slide there? Because I just got to see what I was going to say. Okay. Um, did you show us the, were you going to show us the, the gym, the hip thing? Oh, the gym? Yeah, it doesn't really, so I can speak to it. I'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We can edit this part out, yeah? I, I'd say yeah. leave it in. I mean, leave it in? It's, it's good. It's organic. Exactly. Okay, well, I'm trying to go viral exactly. here, so exactly. I'm going to need to point it. This is the stuff that you like to go viral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Like, it's just this moment. Like that blooper in the opening reel would be, like, not stop. Cool. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Oh, here we are. Okay, great. So it's showing up on the back screen. So how many juniors do we have? Seniors? Cool. Any jobs yet? Any job offers lined up or internships? Okay, don't freak out. It's all good. <laughs> it's all fine. I had my um, I had an internship my junior going into my senior year at Target, and they gave me a full time offer. But remember, I, I said at the beginning I was a what? A pharmaceutical marketing major, professional drug dealer. So as grateful, as grateful as I was for Target, I had my eye on the ultimate goal, which was getting into biopharma. 
I got my job offer with Sanofi a month before graduation, and it was the best feeling. So don't freak out. You don't have anything by like four weeks before graduation. You're fine. You'll get a job. It's all gonna happen. You paid a lot of money to go here. They're gonna set you up for success. Okay, so that's fine. It's one little plug. We got you. But um, I digress. So. As I mentioned earlier, balance really does make us stronger from a sales education, sales learning perspective. When we think about virtual experiences, what we really utilize the remote and virtual environment for is around skill development. So soft skills, how do we develop that rep of the future that's emotionally intelligent, as I mentioned earlier, and also able to connect in a, in a way with the customer that's confident and clinically savvy, understanding what theirs, what's on their plate, but also balancing their needs with theirs. Um, managers meetings, this is something where before any of our sales meetings, we basically prepare the district business managers to help facilitate the content. That could be done virtually. So we've gained some efficiency by doing that. We don't have to fly everybody out all over the country in order to facilitate that learning. So we really lean into hybrid in that environment. The remote learning gym is a really cool concept and it's being piloted right now for about 20 sales reps that we onboarded from our immunoscience division. Again, Jill, my leader on my team, she said, hey Christian, Australia is doing something really cool called the Remote Learning Gym. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. She's like, they basically use existing content and similar to how you would sign up for a hit class at the gym, you sign up as a learner and you're given content but also your own trainer. And I think that's so cool, right? Because how often do we want guidance direction, just a conversation to crystallize some concepts. So these are short 30 minute classes that you can do on your own at any time and you're going to be guaranteed to have a trainer with you who walks you through the content. So far the recommendations and the feedback has been glowing, it's been outrageous, they love it. Um, so we're really looking forward to expanding this further. And we cover a variety of concepts too, so not just selling skills but competitor, anything related to the business of oncology. So a really cool concept that I think learning and development is going to take with and run in the future, serving content just in time. Yep? Um, is that content available for your group of 400? Yeah. So how many um, on-demand sort of trainers do you have to have ready to go at any given time? We have facilitate that. Yeah, great question. Remind me right one more time. Kate. Kate, awesome, great question. So um, with our uh, platform, we have about 80 field trainers. So with the classes, they, right now in our pilot phase, they have about anywhere from two to five participants, so it's a smaller scale. But we do have folks at the ready who are able to help scale it. I think the max that we would go as far as like a hit class or a remote learning class is concerned, I think would be no more than eight people because we still want to afford that intimacy and also not over-index with time out of territory because we know our salespeople need to be in front of customers. Yeah, great question. And then lastly, from an in-person experiences perspective, this is where we love our sales meetings because sales meetings, especially in pharma, they lead to what's called a hockey stick. So you may be plateauing, 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 performance is great, everything's good, but as soon as you get everybody together and immediately after, you see that it spikes up because why? People are energized, they're renewed, they got together, they're sharing best practices, gleaning insights, so the sales meetings are where we really, as, uh, as we think about you know, our future and think strategically, that's where we're gonna start putting most of our emphasis and going all in with live, is around those sales meetings and those sales connections. And then I most recently attended what's called ASCO Advantage, American Society of Clinical Oncology Advantage Program, and this was where, um, along with 47 of our salespeople, we went down to Alexandria, Virginia, to ASCO headquarters, and we got to be a fly on the wall for oncology practice, uh, practicing oncologists and ask them all types of questions. How do you view our indication? How do you view the competitor products that you use? How do you make treatment decisions? We heard from a live patient. And while we conducted this program virtually for the past two years, live was just amazing. It was such a richer dialogue. You saw the light bulbs going off in real time. People learn the most from those who are learning themselves, and this was a true testament to that. So, in short, you know, of course, I believe that hybrid is the way. I gave my perspective before, but these are just a couple of strategies where really at BMS, if we keep the learner at the center, all things flow. So, I hope you learned something. Um, if you didn't, I'm the Dean of Ryder University. Just kidding. But, um, yeah, it's all good. It's all good.
but I'm happy to answer any questions or reflections that you might have. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.